Uh, yes, David. Okay, so welcome to the new session. Now we're moving more towards the second half of the workshop, more about uh, foundations and quasi-probability distributions. And we'll start with John Dobrota from University of Massachusetts. And he'll talk about discrete bigner functions from informationally complete measurements. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so good morning uh, to some of you. Good afternoon to those of you in my time zone. Good evening to some of you. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and for making this possible. Thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Um, so this is a joint work with Blake Stacy uh, with at that archive listing and it's the same title. Uh, I am a relative um, newcomer to Bigner functions and so I'm studying them from uh, the perspective of what I have studied which uh, is the cubist uh, quantum Bayesian approach to probabilistic uh, representations of quantum theory. So as a result, I'm going to have some perspectives probably, and at least maybe some emphasis that's different from typical Wigner functionology, as it were. But my hope is that relating uh, what cubists have done to at least some aspects of what people in uh, phase space quantum mechanics have done will be enlightening to both things. And I think uh, that's a little bit uh, already underway. Um, this is my first COVID conference, so it's, it's a little jarring to not see any of you. And um, so I guess interrupt me with questions as everyone else has. Um, so the, the talk will be sort of conceptually split into four quest, uh, parts. First one will just be more motivation. Uh, and then the second one will I'll actually describe the the cubist probabilistic approach of quantum mechanics. And then in the third part, I will give a relation between the probabilistic approach from cubism and uh, something like a Wigner function, or at least something that includes all Wigner functions. And then finally, in the fourth part, I'll just uh, basically ask more questions than I answer. And in the third part, you'll see why I drew this this funky uh, drawing of a broken measurement device on the right here. So let, first, let's start with the slogan. Uh, a good basis makes all the difference. Um, sometimes, you know, otherwise obscured features of whatever system you're trying to study will become obvious if you have a good basis. Two examples, uh, the Eddington Finkelstein coordinates in general relativity, which revealed that the Schwarzschild radius was just a coordinate singularity. It had nothing to do with uh, physical singularity. Another example is uh, canonical coordinates. And when you do classical mechanics, once you've chosen a good set of canonical coordinates, a lot of things become trivial that are entirely not obvious when you choose the wrong set. So what is a good basis for finite dimensional quantum mechanics? Um, in this talk, I am always going to be talking uh, about finite dimensional quantum mechanics. So to decide, let's first go back and consider the most general quantum setting. Uh, and I do this particularly because in my experience, people are not used to thinking in the most general terms. They often restrict themselves to pure states maybe as some people already have in this talk or in the, in the conference. And more uh, typically people restrict the actual measurements that they're interested in. Um, even though they are at least peripherally aware of positive operator valued measures, they haven't thought about them in a long time in many cases. So a state is an operator in the operator space on HD, which is our finite dimensional Hilbert space of dimension D. And the uh, operators are positive definite and they have trace one. A measurement is any set of positive semi-definite operators um, any number of them, so n can be any number, such that they're all positive semi-definite and together they all sum to the identity. So then you take both of those concepts and take the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product between them and that is what the Born rule is. It's an association between the set of a measurement and a state and a probability. So let me give a few examples of POVMs just to really drive home the point. In dimension three, you can have a binary measurement, even though D equals three, you can have two outcomes. So this is just one or the other. Um, another example in dimension two, you could have three outcomes. 
So this is the trine measurement, um, and it's called that because if you look at a slice through the block ball, as I've crudely drawn in the corner there, it looks like the Mercedes-Benz symbol, so trine with a three. Now finally, the, the example that most people are familiar with, the von Neumann measurement, which are the measurements derived from Hermitian observables. So in particular, the POVM that you get for a von Neumann measurement are formed from the eigenprojectors of a uh, Hermitian operator. So this example is the spin X operator, and the POVM then is the set of projectors onto the plus and minus basis. Okay, so observables, uh, if you focus on those, will give you an orthonormal basis for the vector space. Um, and then, of course, as a POVM, you get something with V outcomes. Uh, however, if what we wanted was a basis for quantum mechanics, then the dimension of the operator space is E squared. So a single observable isn't going to be enough to give us a basis. So I, I propose that what we want is an operator basis. So shifting gears just a little bit, um, let me remind you of the many decades of work on uh, phase space quantum mechanics exemplified by Wigner functions. These allow you to map density matrices to real normalized phase space functions with meaningful marginals. Um, what do I mean by normalized? I mean that if I integrate over X and P, you get one. And meaningful marginals means that if I integrate over one, I get the probability distribution for the others. This is the continuous version, but it is used to motivate uh, numerous finite analogs. So all of those essentially, I think, take the form of an orthogonal operator basis. So phase-based operators is usually the way that they're phrased. That's a, set, that's a basis of operators labeled by some X and P, which uh, are the replacement for a continuous phase space. And there's many ways to, to do that. So you have to put in work trying to decide what it is you mean by a discrete phase space. But in any case, the, uh, the, the function you get from the operator basis is obtained in the same way as the Born rule. Namely, you take trace of your density matrix and the operator basis, and that gives you the real value function. So a lot of work goes into finding the useful notion of the phase space. And as a result, there's many different versions. I think Wooters has two. Uh, there's a gross one. Um, I recently discovered this one from Galetti. Uh, remember, I, I recently discovered bigger functions to begin with. So maybe uh, you know all of those very nicely. Anyway, another slogan. Uh, everything has a price. Um, there are quasi These are all quasi-probability representations. And by that, I mean they are probabilities which can go negative. Um, and on the face of it, a negative probability is not something that means anything with, other than maybe with respect to other notions that can translate it into something useful. So the reason why quasi-probabilities are used is because you can use a phase space. So really, you are uh, paying with your operational meaning for a, for a phase space. It's also known that uh, negativity it inevitably crops up in quasi-probability representations of quantum theory. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's actually really helpful for talking about the distinction between classical and quantum, uh, especially due to its relation to contextuality. It's also known that uh, negativity can be identified as a resource in quantum computation. So from some perspectives, negativity is a good thing. Um, I only cited two papers here, but numerous papers by other speakers and probably many audience members would have sufficed and would have been a very you know, valuable addition to this list. It's a big topic. Um, basically, as a newcomer to Wigner functions, I'm trying to learn uh, by relating to what I've studied, which is the probabilistic approach to quantum uh, of cubism to quantum theory. Um, so immediately you see a friction because I just told you that uh, negativity was inevitable. Uh, but as with everything, uh, a statement like that depends on what kind of problem you're talking about. Um, so in 1951, Feynman said the following, the new theory asserts, and this new theory is quantum mechanics, that there are experiments for which the exact outcome is fundamentally unpredictable. And that in these cases, one has to be satisfied with computing probabilities of various outcomes. 
But far more fundamental was the discovery that in nature, the laws of combining probabilities were not those of the classical probability theory of Laplace. So he's speaking you know, of, of probability amplitudes, but the moral is the same. Um, essentially, what I want to say then is that negativity is, is necessary and is inevitable, but quasi-probabilities are not inevitable. And let's unpack that statement by actually sketching what uh, I mean by this probabilistic representation. So forget about physics for a second. Let's just talk about this really simple toy scenario um, with no particular physical model underlying it. Say you have a physical system, which I've drawn as a cube, and you plan to do two things to it, which I represent as these boxes with inputs and outputs. The H box you put your system into, you get an outcome, uh, something gets spat out of the other side of the H box and you feed that into the D box and it gives you an outcome. And say you have probabilities for the outcomes of each of those. So probability for the H outcomes and all of the different indexed by I, and then conditional on each of those outcomes, you have a probability for the D measurement. Then uh, on pain of incoherence, and by that I mean Dutch book incoherence, which is a reference to the subjective Bayesian school of probability theory, which I don't really have time to go into more here. But on pain of that incoherence, which basically just means internal inconsistency, then uh, a theorem of probability that I'm sure you've all seen many times has to hold, it's called the law of total probability. So that just says that the probability for the second measurement has to be the expectation value for the conditional probabilities for that second measurement given the first. So written down here on the left in uh, sort of index notation. Uh, for the rest of the talk, basically when I have a vector, I'm going to write it in vector notation. So P of D is a drop in for the entire vector of all of the different DJs in that vector. And then P of D given H is a conditional probability matrix. So you can see that the, the law of total probability simply takes the form of a vector equals a matrix times a vector. Uh, one thing that's nice to to point out, at least in passing here, uh, since I'm not going to go further into the development of subjective probability theory, is that no individual term is fixed uh, by by any part of the theory. The thing that ha that that is important is the relation. They are only constrained by the others. So theorems of probability theory allow you to detect inconsistencies in your beliefs, but they don't tell you how to resolve them. You basically, what happens is you notice that you're not being consistent, and so that means you have to go back to the drawing board. Okay, so what if, what if instead of thinking of this particular setting uh, where we're doing two measurements, what if you skip the first measurement? Probabilities, uh, let me say for this different uh, experiment, let me denote those by Q. Um, well, probability theory actually gives no guidance. Uh, different experiment, different expectations. So, okay. However, uh, many times people would like, or at least it's very familiar to associate Q of D with the same probability uh, as P. And, uh, and I'm saying that that's an assertion of physics because basically what you're saying is that the intermediate measurement didn't matter. Um, if, if it is the case that that second probability distribution is equal to the probability distribution derived from the law of total probability, you're making an assertion of physics. Why might you make such an assertion? Well, it probably is because you have, for whatever toy world you're thinking of, some phase space coordinate, local hidden variable, physical condition, microstate, etc., that kind of a picture in the back of your mind of a property that you've associated to your system. So I've drawn my uh, physical system with uh, phase space coordinates sort of uh, carved into it. Um, the, so, so then, uh, if you have all of those things, then what you're dealing with is a classical world. So Q of D equals P of D is a classical addition to probability theory. So if you have such a thing, um, e, if you have a probability distribution over your microstates, you can calculate the probabilities for any other measurement. So for instance, a Liouville distribution, that's a probability distribution over a phase space. Uh, from that, you can calculate any coarse-grained measurement, which is what any other measurement is, say total energy, total angular momentum. If you know the, the physics underlying your microstates, 
then you can calculate how probability distributions evolve. Uh, here's an even simpler toy model. Imagine the, uh, the identity of a card. So in that case, the microstate is what card it is. If you have a probability distribution over which card it is that you will get if you flip it over, then you can derive any derived probability from, uh, from that distribution. So if I wanted to know the probability for spades or for red or for suits, I can calculate it in that direction. But from these coarse grained measurements, I can't calculate what my uh, measurement for the actual microstates are. So now I want to say a very crucial point, which is that I didn't actually need the microstates in order to think about this concept of having probabilities for one measurement allowing you to derive probabilities for any other measurement. Um, instead of microstates, all, all you really need to do is think of them as probabilities for the outcomes. And by outcomes, I mean the consequence for the agent of an action that that agent took. So in some sense, it's, it's the experience that the agent has. Um, so that's the thing that is labeled by the probability. Uh, potentially interesting to see what you find if you don't basically posit a phase space is, is sort of what I'm trying to say. Um, any measurement, so this is what's motivating my uh, more general notion of a reference measurement than a reference measurement being related to any sort of uh, ontic state space underneath. It's just any measurement for which your distribution of it fixes your distribution for any other reference, any other measurement. So you can go in that direction, but not backwards. So obviously from a classical mindset, this is an unimportant distinction, but in a world without local hidden variables, we have to be very careful. And, and all of the different kinds of, of proposals for finite uh, or discrete phase spaces are a, a testament to the fact that it's, it's not clear exactly what we need to do in a world where these things are not the case. So let's turn to the fact that back to quantum mechanics, in other words. Um, turns out in quantum mechanics, there are reference measurements also, even though, as I say, uh, you can't have at least a naive uh, phase space. So the reference measurements are called minimal informationally complete POVMs, uh, MEEKs for short. So I'll call them MEEKs from now on. A MEEK is just a POVM, uh, as I gave many examples at the beginning, which also happens to be a basis. So there is a basis, which is also a measurement. Great. Uh, D squared outcomes because the operator space is D squared. So the, for example, for a qubit, a meek it would be a measurement that has four outcomes. A single measurement, so say like a box with four lights on it, a different light will light up uh, for each particular outcome. Um, so as, as, as operators, they will have to form a convex body if you represented them in the block ball which encloses the middle state. Uh, the reason for that, the maximum mixed state, the reason for that is because otherwise it wouldn't be able to add to the identity. So uh, you may have heard a, a, a quote, uh, sometimes attributed to Schrodinger, that is that a quantum state is a catalog of uh, probabilities or expectations. Well, actually, uh, if you have a probability distribution for meek, that one probability distribution is equivalent to a quantum state. So all of the information of a density matrix is in that one probability distribution. We can map back and forth between uh, rho and P of H. So of course, in all of this, uh, the outcome, as I said earlier, is not a microstate, it's an outcome. So some facts about MEEKs. Um, you can make them in every dimension. And in fact, there's infinitely many in every dimension. And they're easy to construct. Other measurements, unlike the classical case, are not in general coarse grainings of meeks. Uh, so in fact, it's just a more interesting state space. Maybe uh, from some perspectives, quantum mechanics is worse than classical mechanics, but in, um, from my perspective, it's, it's more interesting. <laughs> so uh, another important property, especially for this talk, is that meeks cannot be orthogonal. The reason is because orthogonality doesn't fit in the, pos in the cone of positive operators. And a consequence of that is that, in fact, you cannot be certain for the outcome of any meek measurement. It's actually a violation of quantum mechanics. This is sort of a, a um, uncertainty principle type. It, it's, it's like an uncertainty principle because your reference probability measurement can't be too sharp. 
So here I've drawn a few uh, images of what it might look like if you took qubit state space and used the Born rule with three different meeks and mapped the entirety of, of quantum state space to a proper subset of a reference simplex. So you can see the tetrahedron is a probability simplex and each of the vertices is a probability one for one outcome and zero for the others. The regions that I have drawn inside are supposed to represent uh, the probabilities that are compatible with quantum mechanics. So you can actually study uh, quantum state space as a subset of a reference simplex. So see the uh, archive listing I've written at the bottom for some more um, general properties of Meeks. But of course, no talk about Meeks can happen without a mention of the most cherished Meek of all. Many of you probably have not thought about Meeks in general at all, but you have probably heard of this one. I'm of course talking of the symmetric informationally complete PODMs, the SEEKs. Uh, a SEEK is an, a Meek, first of all, but secondly, it is rank one. So all of the operators in it are, are proportional to rank one projectors, and it is crucially equiangular. So by that, I mean uh, that the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product of all pairwise effects is equal. In, um, once again, in dimension two, where we can visualize things in the block ball, excuse me, uh, a seek is any regular tetrahedron that you described in the block ball. So that's the, the set of pure states, and then the effects are rescaled by one half. So seeks are beloved. They really are. They've, they've, they've proven to be strongly optimal for many foundational applied purposes. And, uh, and really, the more you learn about them, it, it, it just it, it sucks you in. They, they're known to inspire devotion verging on the mystical, and maybe verging is, is, is not appropriate because it, it is, it's almost a religion at this point. So uh, why are they so special? Essentially because they sit at the intersection of many seemingly unrelated fields. So some things that seeks are, they are a minimal quantum two design. They are an equiangular type frame. Uh, there's actually a relation to Hilbert's 12th unsolved problem uh, that has cropped up in people's attempts to prove that seek exists, seeks exist in all dimensions. So that was the, the skeleton in the closet. I didn't tell you in the previous slide, but uh, seeks are not known to exist in all dimensions, although I think it's fair to say that the opinion of literally everyone who works on them is that they do exist in all dimensions. And we do know that they exist in an incredibly large number of finite dimensions, up to around uh, 180 or something, almost inclusive. They've long been the favorite structure of cubists, and we will see some reasons why. And anyway, the point that I'm making in general is that although seeks may be the best for some purposes, really they are just one point in a landscape of meeks. And the structure of that space we would like to understand better, even if after we understand it perfectly, maybe maybe it's the case that we will look and stand at that landscape and it will just be in a monument to seeks. Point for, uh, for developing the probabilistic approach, however, is that any meek can be a reference measurement. So now that the tools are in place, let us return to the two hypothetical measurement scenarios I described earlier. So, now I've drawn them all in one picture, where the dotted path represents the first measurement I, uh, scenario I described, and the solid path represents the second one. And we have all of the relevant probabilities in place. Since the world is not classical, the empirical addition to probability theory is not going to be equal to the law of total probability. So we shouldn't make a classical assumption because the world is not classical. Q of D does not equal P of D. Instead, we use the Born rule. If we want the Born rule to nonetheless be structurally equivalent to the law of total probability, that is a matrix times a vector, then it turns out we can't make both that conditional probability matrix and the probability vector probabilities, uh, at least not with the most economical representation of a meek. But uh, why? would you demand this structure? I mean, this structure came from the law of total probability and a perceived virtue for the addition that you get from thinking about phase spaces. But if I'm not thinking about phase spaces, which is the, the initial posit of this, this thrust, 
then uh, we actually may retain probabilities as a conceptual primitive. So let's, let's uh, see how we can do that by returning to quantum mechanics in this measurement scenario. So now, uh, for the quantum system on the left, I've assigned a density matrix rho. And for the post-measurement state after the uh, H measurement, I have a set of density matrices, which um, it will spit out dependent on which outcome is obtained. And now also for the measurements, I'm now describing them with POVMs. So the measurement up there in the sky is a reference measurement, so it's a meek. And the reference I, and, the, and the measurement on the ground is literally any POVM you wish. So uh, now we can actually utilize the Born rule to calculate uh, what the P of H and the Q of D and the P of D given H all have to be um, in order to talk about this situation. And if you do so, then a simple manipulation can rearrange the, uh, what amounts to just the Born rule and an update procedure into this form. So Q of D equals P of D given H, this phi matrix, which I call the Born matrix, times P of H. Um, the Born matrix is defined thusly through its inverse. Um, and the, the, the upshot of this is that now the operationally defined uh, it's now an expression entirely in terms of operationally defined things. Uh, and we get to use uh, the nice meaningful structure of probabilities. And the only thing that's changed is now, as Feynman would say, the method of, cal of, of combining probabilities has changed. This allows us to directly study the distinction between quantum, quantum and classical as different additions to bare probability theory. Uh, and all of it is captured by that matrix, the Born matrix. The difference between phi and the identity would therefore ca ca uh, capture a difference between quantum and classical. If uh, any of you have been to a talk by Chris Fuchs in the last decade or so, you've seen this equation. Um, if the me reference measurement we're talking about is a seek, and if we update to the proportional seek outcomes uh, for the sigma, set, then the Born rule, this previous expression, becomes this. It simplifies dramatically, and it's really nice for aesthetic reasons because, look, it's, it's actually very similar to the law of total probability. The only difference is that we have this d plus 1 and the minus 1 over d, but it, it, it's almost reminiscent of the law of total probability. And it turns out that that's not merely aesthetic, but it's in fact uh, no mathematical accident either. It's uh, the closest quantum addition that one can can furnish with astonishing generality. And when I say closest, I mean in terms of an operator distance. And, and actually, I mean in terms of any unitarily invariant operator distance. So the absolute closest that phi, that phi any phi for any meek and post-measurement set can be to the example that gives this equation above is when both the meek and the post-measurement sets are, are seeks. And that's if and only if we proved that in, in the paper below. It followed from a majorization lemma that, that may actually be of independent interest for, for instance, resource theory. OK, so what, what is a, a, maybe not the cubist dream, but a cubist dream? Uh, it is a reconstruction of quantum theory, assuming little more than an empirically motivated normative addition. That's, that's buzzwords uh, to probability theory. If we have one of those, it may suggest new insights into the nature of reality, or at least new places to look for them. So an empirically motivated normative addition to probability theory might be the, uh, the new form of the Born rule, like when you were with the seeks. Some progress in this direction has been made, and by uh, in this direction, I mean some progress has been made in, uh, in throwing away the, the uh, assuming anything about quantum mechanics and seeing how much of it you can get just from the uh, idea that, that a physical theory is a different empirically motivated norm of addition to probability theory. So you can see this paper called Introducing the Qplex. But in the end, we really do need more people to get interested in this whole program. And one way to do that is to connect this approach when people already know. 
the one people already know, or at least a lot of people already know about, are uh, quasi-probability representations and Wigner functions in particular. So I didn't tell you anything about phi, but uh, perhaps the most important property of it is that it is quasi-stochastic. So that means that it sends probabilities to quasi-probabilities, and it must contain negative numbers for the same reason that quasi-probability representations have to contain negative numbers. So that's why I say the negativity was still inevitable, even though quasi-probabilities were not inevitable. So if we want to go back to quasi-probability representations, simply restore, restore the structural form of the law of total probability, because that's what caused them to appear in the first place, uh, modulo demands of a phase space. Um, so one easy way to do that is to just say, well, phi acting on P of H, uh, consider that as a unit, just group those together. And now suddenly I have a matrix times a vector again. This choice would put all of the negativity into the uh, reference quasi probability in this case. Uh, another choice that you could make, provided that you can split the Born rule in half like the, or the Born matrix in half like this, is uh, evenly distribute the negativity to both sides. This has uh, provided, it's possible, the upshot of transforming both sides equally. It, 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 it treats so far as one can on equal footing the sort of uh, duality between states and measurements. So another, another motivation, uh, just before we get to the actual description of, of a connection that I, that I noticed, is uh, in a paper a few years ago by Huang Jin Zhu uh, called Quasi-Probability Representations of Quantum Theory or Quantum Mechanics with Minimal Negativity. So he was interested in light of the fact that negativity is a resource, he's, he's interested in how much of that resource or how little of that resource is, is possible in quantum mechanics. In order to push negativity to its limits, Zhu was, was as I have been so far, phase space agnostic um, in, his, in his generalization. So he, he made a generalization that does include all of the Wigner functions that people, or the discrete Wigner functions that people consider in, in the literature, but uh, in, in the search space, he didn't make any particular demand of a phase space meaning. And this worked out really nicely for him because Seeks appeared. Uh, I consider the appearance of Seeks in itself to be a virtue because I've drunk the Kool-Aid on, on, uh, on as far as the Seeks go. Uh, the HJs in, in these uh, operators are Seeks. And uh, you have the top one and the bottom one there, which are the uh, minimal and maximal negativity representation. Um, so, I liked that association. It's the first time that I had the idea of relating uh, any meek and Wigner functions. And so the natural next question is, is there a good procedure for relating uh, all meeks with, with, with Wigner functions, not just the seeks? But whatever association we do come up with, uh, we would like to preserve this special case because it definitely seems to be the right connection to make. So to do that, I need to make a general setting where um, meeks and Wigner functions, or whatever I want the generalization of, of Wigner functions to be, to both be special cases. So I call this one a measure basis. It's, it's pretty broad. Uh, it would be any basis for the operator space, uh, such that it sums to the identity and all of the effects have traits greater than uh, or equal to zero. So there's no demand that they be positive semi-definite, in fact, uh, if they were positive semi-definite, they would be a meek. There's no demand that they be orthogonal. Uh, and in fact, if they are the orthogonal, I'm going to say that they are a, my particular generalization of a discrete minimal Wigner function or just Wigner function going forward. But do they have to be Hermitian? They do have to be Hermitian, but everything has to be Hermitian in uh, LHD. I'm, I'm, I'm calling, that's the, the Hermitian vector space. Okay. So it's space of Hermitian operators. Yes. Okay. Um, so the, uh, and just like with the quasi-probability representations and just like with the Born rule. Sorry, another question. Yeah. Can I ask, sorry. Uh, um, why are you restricting to bases? I mean, you okay. could think of over-complete uh, sets. Uh, I consider the over-complete uh, arena to be uh, more, there's more potential for 
for confusing myself because of the fact that there would be more than one way to represent uh, a state. So um, basically I, what I don't want to say is that I consider the appearance of negativity uh, in the overcomplete setting or not as really indicative of very much. If I, if I allow as many outcomes or uh, if I allow a probability distribution of arbitrary length and uh, you just look for a representation that doesn't have negativity, well then from my perspective, the, the, the use of the negativity uh, that it had from the quasi-probability situation has sort of gone away. Maybe I could be convinced otherwise. Um, and I, I know you have a paper where you, you've done this, so I, I look forward to uh, actually reading it more carefully. Okay, uh, I don't want to uh, interrupt too much, but I guess the uh, discussion will come back to this. Okay. Uh, when I'm talking about a meek, I will use H. When I'm talking about a Wigner function, I will use F. Uh, so this, this measure basis uh, generalized setting, at least it's general in terms of being most economical with the shortest probability or with the shortest vectors, is a slight generalization of juice consideration. How so? Well, it's a generalization because it allows for a bias. So what's a bias? The bias I define to be the list of the weights, which are the, the traces of the, the operators in the basis. And why is it a bias? Well, because D times the probability obtained from the maximally mixed state, which we consider to be the state of, of no information, complete uh, ambivalence, indifference, uh, ignorance, if that is mapped to anything other than a flat probability distribution, then you could say, well, there's an intrinsic bias in what you are considering a reference measurement. Zhu considered only unbiased Wigner functions. So in the unbiased case, it's very easy to see that the weight is always one over D. Uh, I have to admit the biased case is a little bit perverse, but it might be that in some general informational scenario, there's a baked in bias or you find yourself with one. So we want to be able to accommodate as much as we possibly can. Okay, so how do we relate Meeks and Wigner functions? I actually gave a hint earlier uh, when I talked about the even-handed split. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm going to restrict the Born matrix to be uh, the one that you obtain from the proportional post-measurement state. So that's when sigma i is just the renormalized version of the effect of the, of the meek or in, in the in the ground sky picture that I drew earlier. Um, so Wigner functions are, are orthogonal. So therefore we definitely uh, what we're looking for is an orthogonalization procedure within the measure basis framework. The even handed transformation that I talked about at the end of the, the a few slides ago with the principal square root of such a Born matrix gives the seat convention that we were looking for. So this direction is promising. And that splitting in half of the Born matrix now finally explains why I fractured a measurement device uh, at the beginning of the slide. Of course, it's a cartoon, but, but now you finally see. So let's, let's pursue this further. We will define something called the principal Wigner function. In the, in the unbiased case, uh, that, that, that square root operator uh, situation that I was talking about turns out to be actually proportional to something that's been studied before, a symmetrized version of the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization procedure. This is very nice. Uh, we just, I, I, didn't, I didn't bake it in, but it just happened that way. Or, I mean, I guess with proper insights, maybe it should have been obvious, but uh, it, it was nice to discover that the, the first thing I tried was, was something that is, has been tried many times in the past. Um, for, for an arbitrary bias, however, the, the precisely the same thing doesn't work. Um, a, a small tweak was necessary to render our notion of a Wigner function the analog of an orthonormal basis. So the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization gives you an orthonormal basis. The Wigner function is not orthonormal. So in the unbiased case, it just required a uniform rescaling. But in the biased case, you need to be a little bit more careful and do a sort of element-wise rescaling. Um, so now this, this is maybe the most technical few slides. Um, and if you don't know about the frame super operator, then you can just take this uh, as, 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 as it goes. 
So basically, let SL be the frame super operator of a rescaled basis. So the measure basis is L. This is L rescaled by one over the square root of each of the bias elements. Then the frame operator of that acts as follows, uh, super operator of that. So X is uh, an operator. And on the right hand side, we have another operator, hence super operator. And then the principal Wigner function, uh, which works for any biased measure basis, is the set that you obtain by taking the half inverse super operator acting on each of the basis elements. And you can prove that this is a Wigner function and there's a few other things which I'll say in a minute. Uh, for bias measure bases, so th this, this definition doesn't look like the, the phi part, so you can connect it to that. For a biased measure basis, the, the Born matrix is not generally positive semi-definite, but nonetheless, it has all positive eigenvalues. And so there is a, a square root, which also has all positive eigenvalues, which I've written down there below. And it turns out that that square root gives you the coefficients for the principal Wigner function defined on the previous slide in the measure basis itself. And then in the quasi-probability representation, then it, it all works out like the, the even-handed splitting that I was uh, talking about in, in uh, superficial language earlier. So this has a few nice properties. It preserves the bias uh, of, of your measure basis. It also preserves, or it doesn't preserve, but it transforms equivalently with unitary conjugation. So you conjugate uh, a measure basis element and that's equal to the conjugation of the principal Wigner function. And then group covariance, uh, which I didn't define, but if you're familiar with it, it's the, the idea that a whole set is generated by one element of it under the action of a group. So group covariance is preserved in the forward direction because uh, of, the, of, the, of the previous unitary property. And then, of course, another Question. night. Yes? So for, for what group? What a covariance under what group are you oh, talking about? It would be any group, but uh, most likely Valheisenberg group. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so, and then, and then one nice thing that we like to have in quantum mechanics is for things to respect tensor products. And indeed, the principal Wigner function of L tensor L prime, uh, which by which I mean a shorthand for all of the element wise inner product, uh, all of the element wise tensor products that will form another measure basis, which is pretty easy to see. That is equal to the it distributes over the principal Wigner function convention. Okay, so uh, as you might expect for something that's really just an orthogonalization, um, many measure bases share a principal Wigner function. And when they do, we say that they are Wigner equivalent, denoted with this squiggle W. For the rest of the talk, I will only consider the unbiased situation. One thing that we would like to know, uh, in, in the, the thing we would like to know is what is the shape of Wigner equivalence among meets? Because if we know that, then we've, we've, we've added additional structure onto the meek space. And in order to study that, we can study Wigner equivalence shape for any measure basis and then restrict to the positive semi-definite cone. So the first obvious place to look for other Wigner equivalent um, measure bases are bases that are in the same direction, so to speak, but of different lengths. So if we are doing something that's akin to an orthonormalization, then normal is always normal. We always are going to be uh, making it the same length. So everything along a particular line, it seems like should uh, be Wigner equivalent. So what lines are we actually interested in? Uh, you have to be a little careful because we need to be preserving the measure basis concept, uh, by, it, by which I mean it has to sum to the identity and have positive weights. So I define collinear measure bases parameterized by T to be measure bases al along this line between the measure basis and this average element, uh, one over D squared. It's average because it sums to the identity and there's D squared of them. And this is for the unbiased case, of course. You can also define, uh, with a slight modification, the same concept of collinearity for biased meets. So indeed, for positive t, 
the LT is Wigner equivalent to the principal Wigner function. And for negative T, uh, LT is Wigner equivalent to another Wigner, Wigner function, which I call the shifted principal Wigner function. Uh, so I didn't talk about this earlier, but the shifted, there is for every Wigner function, there is a shifted Wigner function, which is the reflection across uh, state space through this, this, this average uh, element. So all of that sort of makes sense. If you have a basis pointing in one direction, you would expect it orthogonalizes out here until you suddenly are pointing in the other direction and you would expect it to orthogonalize the other direction. So once we have one Wigner equivalent measure basis, we actually have a whole line. And as I mentioned earlier, this will necessarily include an interval of Meeks when the line intersects the positive semi-definite cone of operators. And it's actually pretty easy to just calculate what the T interval is that will make a measure basis equal to a Meek. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belabor that, but it's easy to calculate in terms of the eigenvalues. Measure bases themselves actually provide the key to generating the rest of the Wigner equivalence class beyond just the collinear ones. So we noticed that if you start with a Wigner function and then choose any measure basis you like, then the positive half power of SL acting on that Wigner function will give you a Wigner equivalent measure basis, which you could then shrink back to meek space um, along, the, along the parallel lines. So the Wigner equivalence class itself should be relatively easy to numerically study. All right, so sort of last phase now is, is, is I, 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 I showed that this, this one very, very simple association between Meeks and Wigner functions, but all of this, all this really does is make us wonder whether even stronger conventions exist. So in particular, it makes us wonder about the inverse question. Is there a Meek that is most notably behind a Wigner function. The Born rule in the probabilistic form suggested an orthogonalization to Wigner functions, but what about starting from a Wigner function and finding a genuine reference measurement in quantum mechanics, which is somehow uh, intimately associated? Yeah, so as I say, Wigner equivalence is just a starting point. We need extra constraints to narrow down that pre-image. There are a couple things you could think about. You could prioritize uh, desirable reference measurement properties, such as the average rank, maybe, of the meek. Uh, low rank meeks are, are genuinely better than, than high rank meeks for informational considerations. You could uh, uh, also, from sort of the opposite mindset, pull back useful Wigner function properties. So one thing that I have in mind there is say, well, look, all of these proposals for nice Wigner functions have uh, some notion of a discrete phase space. Well, we know Meeks don't have a phase space, but what if there's something that's sort of reflecting the phase space in Meeks, or something that is related to the nice property of the Wigner function that gets pulled back to a function or some regularity among Meeks? One uh, potentially fruitful convention we actually uh, were able to prove something about. So that question is, maybe the distance is important, distance between the meek and the principal Wigner function. So inherited from this, this symmetrized Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process is the fact that for any meek in an equivalence class, its principal Wigner function is actually the closest Wigner function by least squares error. So what I've written here is an abusive notation. What I mean is the element-wise operator products uh, summed up but it, it captures the point. Basically, the principal Wigner function is the closest that, that a meek can ever be to a Wigner function. And because of the normalization consideration, we find that the shifted principal Wigner function is the farthest you can ever be from a given, a given meek. And this motivates us to ask, well, what about, uh, once again, what about the reverse question? Given a Wigner function, what is the closest meek? In general, that's probably really hard to answer. But in the most extreme case, we can answer it again, thanks to our favorite structure, Seeks. Uh, Seek is the closest a meek can ever be to any Wigner function. And that distance is achieved if and only if uh, the meek is a Seek and F is the principal Wigner function from uh, Zhu's paper. And the farthest it can ever be is when it's the shifted 
uh, principal figure function. So that's the boundary of this whole consideration. Everything else is going to be some area of gray in between. But for any particular Wigner equivalence class uh, and any particular Wigner function, there will be potentially a closest meek in its Wigner equivalence class. And potentially that meek is conceptually important uh, for similar reasons that the Wigner function itself is. And it's just an idea. There's many other ideas that, 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 that may work. Um, another point, uh, basically this, this ex extremality is another point towards the view of seeks as the natural analogs of orthogonal operator bases, which actually fit into the positive semi-definite cone. So you can't have orthogonality, but you can get uh, just exactly this close. Okay, so uh, to finish, uh, just, just to note like maybe some applied directions to, to go in. So in dimension two, any unbiased Wigner function by my by definition is Wigner equivalent to a seek. Uh, because seeks are just the, the regular catch region. There's not a lot of room for there to be nice uh, regular structures in dimension two. In dimension three, uh, Wooters' convention, uh, the original one, is actually the, the shifted principal Wigner function of another seek called the Hesse seek, which is a very special seek in dimension three. So, you know, you can, you're starting to see a theme probably that you, you, you start a problem and then you look for seeks to be optimal because they so often are. Uh, in dimension four, however, um, suddenly the, the, the seek is a, a novel Wigner function to consider, which um, it may have particularly nice features. So another thing sort of along the same lines, you could, you could leverage the fact that there is a sporadic seek in dimension eight called the Hogar seek, which instead of being covariant with respect to the Valheisenberg group, as all other seeks are or seem to be, it's actually covariant with respect to the three qubit uh, Val Heisenberg group. So its associated Wigner function may be of special conceptual interest. Of course, the seeks themselves are of special conceptual interest, but I got to convince you of that and I got to do it through Wigner functions. Another uh, last one to consider is, is maybe uh, dynamics. So if, if you want to talk about dynamics in Wigner functions, then you need uh, the triple products because you have the commutator and then you need to have a representation of it. So that's three products. Um, how does triple products for general meek situation play with Wigner equivalence? Triple products have been studied for seeks as well. So all of those properties pipe over very easily, but we don't know the situation for more general meeks. Anyway, the takeaway is that both structures should be studied. Uh, that's, that's, that's how I feel about it, and how they relate stands a chance of advancing both fields and our understanding of quantum mechanics in general. So uh, this is the archive. The new version should be coming probably within a week or so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, John, for the clear talk. Um, we had a couple questions already, but we have time for maybe one or two more. Okay. Um, do I, let's see, I have to click on the Q&A thing. Right, there's one in the Q&A, can you see it? Yep, okay. Thank you for the talk, John. Does the meek generalization proposed work only in dimension for which seek exists? Uh, no, um, you don't, I don't need seeks to exist. Meeks always exist. Uh, and if a seek exists, it's a very special, super nice seek. In fact, it's sort of, on the boundary of, of seek space in many, many, many ways, uh, most optimal seek. If a seek doesn't exist, then you know, uh, complex vector spaces have some some uh, some explaining to do, as it were. But but meeks always exist. Um, would the principal Wigner function in dimension two be any unbiased Wigner function? Yeah, yes, yes, it is. So um, I I said that uh, in the second to last slide. Um, two to the n, so you're thinking of n qubit situation. Um, one thing that uh, in, in that situation, it's not a seek because seeks do not combine to make higher seeks from tensor product structure. Uh, it would be a tensor product of qubit seeks. And in fact, uh, Blake and I, in another paper, named this the tensorhedron meek. Um, and that is probably at least a good pre-image of uh, 
bigner functions for n qubits. Is there are there more questions or do I or will they appear here? No open questions. Cool. All right, any more questions? Okay, if not, then thank you again, John.